everybody, my name is Stevie B, and I'm a recovering alcoholic and a proud member of the West Side Men's Group. Nice. It's great to be here with you guys tonight. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It feels like I haven't seen you guys since last year. All right, I'm just going to use that once. Thank you. Are we keeping both doors open? Is that what we're doing? Okay, well, we'll see what happens. I start to melt halfway through, so if I'm not here, just come and get me. No, we'll be okay. Well, if you're here for the first time tonight, we're on the fourth step. We've been doing the third step for uh, four weeks, actually. So you came in a perfect time. We're going to be talking about making a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And usually that sounds like a step that just is, I mean, just think about it. Just think about what it says. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. There's no juice in that. Nobody likes that. Nobody got excited when I said we were on the fourth step. There was some ahs and ohs in the back. Because there's not God in that step. There's no, there's no uh, sought through prayer and meditation. There's no excitement. And no one likes to think about morals. We certainly want to think about writing them down or telling anybody else about it. So it's a step that is usually painted with a brush of, ooh. When people talk about when, you, when you're doing the fourth step, it's like, ooh. Come in any time, Todd. Just help work, work yourself. And I want to tell you, there's nothing ooh about the fourth step. There's nothing mysterious. There's nothing scary about it. There's nothing where when you're doing it, people are going to have to pull you uh, aside outside the meeting and, and talk to you about it. It's just one of the 12 steps. Now, it is an important step. In the 12 and 12, it has so much importance that it's written about more than any of the other steps of the 12 other than the 12th step. Because the 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of working these steps, we carry these principles and we carry this message to alcoholics, and that's, of course, what we live on. What we live on. So they wrote about 15 to 17 pages on the 12th step. And looking around the room, there's a lot of people that I've been following for a long time that I know that work the 12th step. But in order to work the 12th step, you have to do a, a searching and fearless moral inventory. And we don't want to hear about that. We don't want to hear about searching and fearless moral inventories. We want to hear about just staying sober. How you doing? I'm just I'm staying sober. How you doing? Just hanging in there. <laughs> hanging in there. Meeting to meeting. Go to meeting. Go to the meetings. Go to the meetings. We don't want to hear about the searching and fearless moral inventory. But if someone said to us that by doing a searching and fearless moral inventory, this is the last time that you need to come back, if someone said to us, you can have a life beyond your wildest dreams, if someone said to you that your wife would be restored to you, your husband would be restored to you, you would have a new life beyond your wildest dreams, not the same old life, that your old ideas would be exchanged for new. If someone painted it like that, we'd be signing up, wouldn't we? We'd be like, where can we do that searching and fearless moral inventory? But nobody says it like that. But those of us that have done it, we know that as we walk out of the fifth step, if we do it with a great sponsor or a great mentor, our great spiritual guide, we know that the magic that happens in the fourth and fifth cannot be overlooked. And looking around the room, I know there's a lot of people that agree with me. So why is it that we make it so almost unattainable to the newcomer? Is it because it was painful for us? I'm not sure. I, know, I, I was in a fraternity, and um, we had this thing called Hell Week. The Hell Week was the last week of our pledging program. Which means for five or six or seven weeks, whatever it was during the pledging program, it was tough. It was real tough. I, I joined a fraternity uh, that was the toughest pledging program other than uh, this one fraternity that was the Omega Sci-Fi's. They used to brand themselves at the end of their pledge program. They used to take a big branding iron, put it in the fire, and brand themselves. I didn't join that one. I wasn't. It was an old black fraternity, but I didn't join that anyway. <laughs> They branded themselves. That was a tough fraternity. But the second toughest fraternity on the campus was Teak. Taught Kappa Epsilon. That's the one that I went for. Because I wanted people to see me out there on the, on the quad, which is where, the, where everyone meets. And I wanted them to see me being marched and, and thrown into the mud and humiliated because, because I felt that 
if the more I was humiliated in public, the more that it would be, mean a lot to me. But there was one week that nobody spoke about during that weekend that was Hell Week. So when you go to the brothers and you say to them, when is Hell Week? They go, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't get ahead of yourself, Steve. Maybe you're not going to make it through Hell Week. And they used to paint this big, scary picture around this Hell Week. And that's the same thing we do in, in the fourth step. You know, immediately we come in, and if, and if you saw that movie Clean and Sober with, with um, who is in that movie? Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. You know, the, the first meeting that he's having with his sponsor, and he's drinking uh, milkshakes, he's already doing the four step inventory. So when I came into the program, I thought it was immediate. I had seen Clean and Sober in treatment. I figured it was, the program was take the first step, drink two milkshakes, and do the four step. <laughs> That's what it seemed like to me. So I figured I was going to just get into this real fast. And I found out after being in, in a treatment for 28 days that they wouldn't even let you delve into the fourth step. They actually even made it um, even scarier in treatment. They're like, no, this is a one, two, three uh, treatment center. Four is when you get out. You know, they say, when well, you get out. You'll be getting a sponsor for that. So let me tell you, and uh, my uh, second sponsor is sitting over here, right here in the first row. So he'll tell you that it took me... Uh, two years to even start writing it down. Because I didn't, first of all, I came into the program when I was 22 years old. I stayed sober a year and a half. I, went, I was in Minnesota. I had, I had no intention. Just had said it beautifully last night. Uh, he came down here when he was 19. He had no intention of staying. And he had no intention of being sober three and a half years later. But he did have an intention for the nightmare of his drugs and alcohol to stop. And that's all I did. When I went to Minnesota, when my parents shipped me out to Minnesota, I, my, my intention was just to stop the nightmare, but not to be in a lifelong in-program type of thing. I mean, I never even heard of anybody in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, let alone me joining up for a lifetime. But I wanted the madness to stop. So when I was in the treatment program and they said that you'll be doing a four-step, I thought, you know, I'll get around to it. I mean, if I stay, you know, kind of like having a personal trainer when you get to the gym. That's not something you sign up for the first day. That's something you might work yourself into. You know, I want to try some treadmill, you know, a little bit of water aerobics. And then if I, if I decide to stay, maybe I'll get myself a personal trainer. And that was the same thing that I felt about the four-step. I didn't come for the four-step. I didn't come for moral inventory. I, I had no, bit, I had no in, interest in taking a moral inventory. And if you're of that belief system, if you feel that the program is just about staying sober, you could stay sober on the first step alone. It'll help you to have the first step and the 12th step. Because in order for us to give, keep it, we have to give it away. And you can stay sober on those two steps. Let me tell you, the reason I know that is a bunch of people that do that. They do that. They do the first step and the 12th step. And they walk around, instead of going from glory to glory, they're going from drama to drama. They always have some type of drama brewing. And God forbid you would ask them how they're doing, or they're going to tell you how they're doing. <laughs> You gotta have a half an hour for those drama to drama people. 26 years. Let me tell you how I'm doing. They're sitting right out there right now, just telling people how they're doing. But in the fourth step, we make a decision if we're really in or if we're playing the game, right, Richie Rich, if we're playing the game. We're either really in or if we're playing the game. And you know how you know if you're really in? You know how you know if you're taking a third step? You'll have a pen in your hand. If you've taken a thorough third step, if you made a decision to have God run your life, if you made a decision to turn your life and your will over to God, that when you get finished with the third step and you just did the prayer, what are you going to have in your hand? You're going to have a pen in your hand. You're going to have a notebook. You're going to have a big book. You're going to have a 12 and 12, and you're going to get busy. That's how you're going to know if you took a thorough third step. It's going to be easy to be able to tell. You're going to be easy to be able to see if you're in. Month goes by, two months go by, three months go by, you're not even thinking about it. Your sponsor's mentioning it too, you're like, well, you know, I have a lot of stuff, I don't want to bring up a lot of issues. Because <laughs> I've been through a lot, I have a, a lot of issues. <laughs> then the next time you see him, you know, we're speaking over at Bark, we have the Tuesday morning 10 a.m. commitment, you see him at Bark again. You see them a year down the road. You guys know what I'm talking about. You've seen the, the people. They're great people. They're our friends. They've been with us a long time. You see them the next month, next year. How you doing? Oh, I'm just coming back. Let me tell you something. We need to be talking about our issues. We need to be laying them down with another human being and with God. We need to lay them out. 
Because if you're walking around with your issues, it's all about is you. It's all about is you and your stuff. And you don't want to be walking around with your own stuff. You want to be able to share it and let it go. But in order to do that in the fifth step, you have to know how to take an inventory. And that's as simple as it is. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. I'm sure you have a closet in your house or your halfway house or you've been involved where there's a closet and sometimes there's clothes in there. I mean, of course, when you're not using. <laughs> there's clothes in your closet. If you come from up north, like I do, during the seasons, you have to go into your closet. I mean, unless you have a big house. I had a small closet. I mean, no disrespect, Mom and Dad, but the closet was not big. <laughs> and coming into the spring... Coming into the spring, what? You walk into the closet, you got all these, I'm from New York, you got all these big jackets, down jacket was a big deal when I was a kid, down, super down, you know, you got a, your, your, your arms are in there, you're an entire jacket, the whole thing. It's a 75 pound jacket with no human being in there. Giant jacket, goose down, goose down, Canadian goose down. We like that, Canadian goose down. You got those giant jackets that just stand like this. But in order to get into your summer stuff, you got to take an inventory of your winter stuff. You got to clear out the closet to bring in the new stuff. You can't have a whole closet full of winter things if summer's coming. And that's all an inventory is. You walk into the closet, looking around, you think these things are good. You got a scarf from the 70s, that needs to go. You got your Z Cavaricci from the 80s, that needs to go. You know what I'm talking about. That needs to go. It's funny because I just ran into my Z Cavaricis a couple months ago and I, was, I didn't want to let them go. You, got, you walk into your closet, you assess what's there, even the stuff that you thought was good, but you bring another person into that closet with you, your sponsor or a priest or a rabbi or a mentor, someone that's been in the program, you bring them in the closet with you. And you bring them in there because you think that stuff needs to be saved. You have lust and anger and wrath. Your seven deadlies on the shelves. You're looking at that, but that's pride. I need to keep that pride. I need to keep, I need to keep all that stuff. We were just talking about that earlier. And, and a gentleman was talking about how he doesn't get involved in that kind of stuff. Because we have to be very careful with pride. Pride is the one thing that will take you out faster than anything else. Because behind pride is most, of the, is most of the defects of character. Once you get prideful, then you get angry. Once you get prideful, then you get short-tempered. Short Once you get prideful, then you don't have patience. Any, everything that follows pride is not good. That's why the Bible says that the fall comes after the pride. We want to try to stay away from pride. We want to keep surrendering pride. Anytime we think that we've arrived, we want to make sure that we know that the only thing we've done has been we've left, but we haven't arrived. Anyone in here has arrived, that's dangerous. No one in here has arrived. No one in here has a better seat. The biggest thing that you could become in Alcoholics Anonymous is a member. I think Jimmy said that this week. Just a member. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's no president of AA. Anybody that I've ever seen become big shot in AA, they just get one shot, and they're all shot. And I didn't make that up. That was Bob from Boston. One shot, we're all shot. Anytime we get big-headed. So we walk into that closet with a sponsor, a mentor, a priest, a rabbi, and we walk in there and we see all these things and we start to write them down. We're not sure if we're going to get rid of them yet, but we're at least going to write them down. We're going to write them down. And we're going to write our defects of character and we're going to start with the ones that are called resentments. The re-feelings. The re-feelings. Like if I'm walking down the street and I see Mark, Mark E and something bad comes over me and something bad feeling and I have to walk to the other side of the street, that's a resentment. If when you mention someone's name to me, I bristle with antagonism, that's a resentment. If you start talking to me about the police and I go like that, that's a resentment. And the big book says that, that these are real, listen to this, I want you to hear this, these are real or imagined. Okay, Sandy, it doesn't have to be real, it could be imagined. Okay, I, I, one guy was telling me a couple weeks ago that he didn't want to come to this meeting because he, he, he felt that there was somebody that here that had a serious resentment against him. Now, I'm not sure if that was real or imagined, but either way, that needs to go down on a piece of paper. And I had a lot of them. I, you know what? I still have a lot of them. When it comes around Christmas time and, and Christmas cards, 